So mm -hmm. we start the last talk of this session from differences to differentials, a higher order calculus of finite differences by two authors, Mario Alvarez Picaro and Luke Hong. And Mario is the speaker. Go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, uh, so this is um, the paper is by me and Luke Hong, but I would like to first of all acknowledge uh, my co-author Jean-Simon Lemay because uh, this work builds in an essential way on my, my previous work with, with Jean-Simon Lemay. And I think uh, at least the first third of this presentation is going to be um, describing that, that joint work with, uh, with Jean-Simon, which is the, the concept of a Cartesian difference category. So I should first um, start by talking a bit about the, the, the context of this work. Um, so this is the, 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 um, the difference lambda calculus tries to present itself as a sort of um, unlikely convergence of two um, very different fields. Um, and on one hand, we have the, uh, the concept of uh, a Cartesian differential categories, which are, uh, as, as you may know, uh, a purely categorical setting in which one can do um, calculus, in which one can do something that's uh, akin to you know, the standard high school differential calculus. Um, these models are, they've, they've shown to be very interesting. There's a lot of uh, fascinating research going on in Cartesian differential categories. Uh, they're partially justified by their own theoretical interests, but they're also justified by the fact that they provide a semantic basis for the differential lambda calculus. And they, uh, they justify the intuitive idea that the differential lambda calculus is really talking about differentiation of higher order functions in the classical sense. On the other hand, and this is sort of my area of expertise, there are, uh, there are settings where ad hoc notions of differentiation have been introduced, uh, most notably incremental computation. Um, so I don't want to talk much about incremental computation here, but intuitively uh, in the field of incremental computation, one can one can think of an incrementalized version of a function as a sort of uh, derivative, except this this kind of derivative is it, it, it's not uh, it's not quite like the standard calculus kind of derivative. It's it's not a it's not linear. First of all, it's not quite an approximation in the same sense as the as the calculus derivative, mm. and so. A year ago at uh, at Fosax, we um, we proposed the, a notion of change action, which was to be uh, a general semantics for derivatives that are li almost linear but not quite. Uh, and we showed that they generalized um, Cartesian differential categories, uh, and they also captured the sort of non-linear derivatives that you see in a bunch of settings. Um, you see them in incremental computation. You see them in the, the calculus of finite differences. You see them in, in Boolean algebra. Um, so they, they show up in a lot of places. Um, but the problem with our original setting of, of change actions is that um, this was much too general. We, we, we relaxed the we relax the conditions of the, of, of the differential operator far too much. Uh, so this work um, aims to present so-called Cartesian difference categories and to show how they still generalize Cartesian differential categories, but they, are, uh, they have enough structure that one can construct a reasonably well-behaved calculus out of them. And it will turn out that this calculus has some very interesting purely syntactic properties. Um, so first, I should uh, I shouldn't go any further without at least sketching what a what a Cartesian differential category is. Uh, so a Cartesian differential category is a left additive Cartesian category, and so left additive just means that you can add arrows together, and this behaves uh, this behaves well with respect to composition. Uh, and for it to be a differential category, it needs to be endowed with a so-called differential combinator, uh, the type of which you, you see in that slide. And you should understand this, this differential combinator 
to just mean d of f is the, the differential of f in the standard geometric sense. Um, there's, a, there's a series of seven axioms that this, um, this differential combinator has to satisfy. Uh, I won't go over them because I'm about to go over some very similar ones, but they they state intuitively they state what you think they should state so the the, the derivative operator is linear in the function uh, it, it's also linear in in its second argument the derivative of a derivative is itself uh, the derivative of zero is zero and and so on so some basic um, sanity uh, rules now how do we get from Cartesian differential categories to difference categories, whatever they are? Well, our original idea was to take Taylor's theorem uh, and just take that as a sort of axiomatic synthetic characterization of what a derivative is. So if you, if you go back, back to your undergraduate vector calculus course, um, Taylor's approximation, what it lets me do is if, you, if I have a, a, a function um, at, at a certain point x, uh, if I want to evaluate it at a, at a x plus epsilon y, where epsilon is some arbitrarily small quantity, uh, I can approximate it by a linear function, uh, which depending on what setting you're thinking about this, you might call this a derivative, the, the Jacobian of the function f, the differential, whatever. Uh, the point is that um, the, the main property of the derivative is that it approximates uh, a function for some, some vaguely defined notion of sufficiently small elements. So we start by giving a purely synthetic treatment of this notion of smallness. Um, so first we define a, a notion of infinitesimal extension. So an infinitesimal extension in, in a left additive category is an operation that lets you take a, a function from A to B and uh, given enough hand waving, what it does is it, it multiplies it uh, by, a, by an infinitesimally uh, small quantity, yes? And so given this, given this sort of synthetic infinitesimal added to to our category we can uh, we can we can um, characterize the derivative in in as precisely uh, approximating a function in this infinitesimal elements so this is what a, this is what a Cartesian difference category is so a, a Cartesian difference category is a Cartesian left additive category equipped with an infinitesimal extension and a difference combinator. And so the, the difference combinator looks a lot like a differential combinator. It, in fact, it, it has the same type and it verifies the, the eight axioms that you can see on the, on the screen right now. Uh, anything from everything from, from one through seven is not very important, but I want to talk about uh, the, the zeroth axiom. So if you read the, if you read the zeroth axiom and you squint hard enough, um, what the zeroth axiom says is that the, 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 the difference of a function uh, approximates the, the original function perfectly uh, on elements of the form epsilon y. So you can read it as, you know, you take Taylor's approximation and you replace the approximately equal by an exactly equal. Um, so this is one of the the, the first of two differences that we have with respect to Cartesian difference categories. So if you're familiar with difference category, with differential categories, uh, all of this is standard except for the axiom, the zero axiom and axiom number two. Uh, so in, in differential categories and indeed in, in standard calculus, you know that the, the derivative of a map is linear in its second argument. In, in this setting, uh, it turns out that there are not that many interesting models that where derivatives are linear. Uh, but there are many interesting models that satisfy a weaker condition, which I, I call regularity, which is captured in, in axiom number two. And so I'll, I'll go a bit of a, the intuition behind this axiom um, in, in, in a bit more detail. 
Um, so if you look at it, this, this axiom says that the difference operator is almost linear, except for uh, a perturbation uh, of the form epsilon y that is inserted in the, in the second term. So if you're familiar with your differential categories, this is identical to the corresponding axiom, except uh, we've added an epsilon y on the, on the second term of the rank height, right uh, hand side. Uh, how should we think about this? Well, it turns out that there are two very good uh, geometric intuitions. Um, the first of which is we can uh, we can start with the term of the form derivative of f at x along u plus v, uh, and we can unfold it once using this almost um, almost linearity, and then you can unfold it twice using uh, a Taylor approximation. And what we see is that this almost linearity means that derivatives are linear up to uh, some, some second derivative or some second order element. Um, geometrically, um, there's a, a nice interpretation of it is that um, the, 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 the derivative operator maps uh, a, a triangle such as the one in the left to a triangle such as uh, the one in the right. Uh, and this this diagram should look a lot like functoriality because in fact this is uh, this regularity condition is nothing more nothing less than a, a, a very sort of concealed um, statement of functoriality um i think i'm 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 running late as is uh, as is usual for me uh, so I, i'm going to skip some you're not I'm so late. Skip some I of mean, this. It's, it's now eleven by past, past two. Yes, no, so it, you still it's have enough. Twenty minutes, including it's, discussion. It, it will be enough. Thank you. Um, so Cartesian difference categories have lots of very interesting properties, uh, but the ones that I want to mention uh, first and foremost, they're a strict generalization of differential categories. Uh, every differential category is a difference category by setting the infinitesimal extension to send every arrow to zero. Um, so a differential category is a difference category when your infinitesimal arrows are just those that are zero. Um, another interesting property is that in any difference category, one can form a, a tangent bundle monad. Um, but most importantly, the, the Gleisley category of this tangent, tangent bundle monad is itself a, a difference category. Now this is interesting because this is um, this is not the case for differential categories. In a differential category, one can can form this identical uh, tangent bundle monad, and one can take its closely category. Uh, but the resulting closely category will fall slightly short of being a Cartesian differential category, but it is a Cartesian difference category. <clears throat> now some some certain important non-properties that I want to remark. Uh, one might think that this, this, if you know any synthetic differential geometry here, you might be tempted to say, well, uh, surely as a theorem, you might have that epsilon squared must be equal to zero. Uh, this is not the case. We have models where it isn't the case. Uh, you might also be tempted to say that, well, epsilon must be idempotent. Um, and that's almost a theorem, but not quite. And we, indeed, we have models where epsilon is not idempotent. Uh, so what's the what's a canonical model of a of a difference category? Mm. Well, so far I haven't given much motivation for the naming. I've just been calling them difference categories. The the driving example of all of this is the calculus the calculus of finite differences. And so the calculus of finite differences has has never been, to the extent of my knowledge, has never been studied from a, a, a semantic or categorical point of view. It's, it's mostly a collection of more or less ad hoc methods that people use sometimes to solve recurrence equations. Um, but we can, it turns out that we can give a very satisfactory formalization of it using um, difference categories. So we start with this, this uh, the category um, ab bar, which we define in, in slightly strange way. Uh, it's a category whose objects are all abelian groups, uh, but whose maps are not group homomorphisms, but rather arbitrary set theoretical functions. 
Uh, and it turns out that this category is a Cartesian difference category uh, and its difference operator it's, it's given, as you can see in the slide, precisely uh, by the, the finite difference of a function. Um, and it's, it's surprising as it may be, this combinator satisfies all of the axioms that I specified before. Uh, let me go back a bit. Uh, this satisfies all of these eight axioms. <clears throat> and um, interestingly enough, one of the things that this provides is, uh, again, to the best of my knowledge, the the first um, account of what the chain rule should be for um, the calculus of finite differences. Now, we have a definition, we have a model, but one of the important properties of Cartesian differential categories is that there is a, a reasonably well-behaved calculus for them. So one has the, the, the differential lambda calculus, um, which was introduced by, uh, by Thomas Erhardt. <clears throat> and this, the, the, it turns out that the models of the differential lambda calculus are themselves uh, a particularly well-behaved set of um, Cartesian differential categories. Uh, and here one might ask if this is the, 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 the same is true of difference categories. And it turns out that the answer is fortunately yes. There is such a thing as a difference lambda calculus. Um, but it turns out that it's not an entirely trivial extension of the differential lambda calculus. So what does this calculus look like? Well, we have a, a set of unrestricted terms <clears throat> that are much the same as the uh, much the same as they, they are in the differential lambda calculus. Um, so you, you look at this syntactic forms. Of course, you have variables, abstractions, applications. You will you can also add arbitrary terms. Zero is a, always a term, um, and you have two extra constructions that should stand for uh, the derivative of a function. <clears throat> along a certain term, and also the infinitesimal extension applies to a term. Um, from those, we construct well-formed terms as uh, an equivalence class of sets of unrestricted terms modulo some, mm, some equivalence relation that captures the, the sort of fundamental algebraic behavior of our calculus. Now, uh, the ones highlighted in this slide are the ones that differ from the differential lambda calculus. So if you're familiar with the differential lambda calculus, the parts in red are the only ones that you don't know. Uh, but in case you're not familiar with the differential lambda calculus, I'll just mention a bit what these mean. The, the, the first block, the top left um, block, simply says that plus is a um, commutative monoid and epsilon is a, a monoid homomorphism. Uh, the second block of equations just says that application is well behaved with respect to the, the monoid structure or semantically the second block of equations says that we're in a Cartesian left additive category. Um, and the third block of equations just states that the derivative operator is linear in the term that you're differentiating. Um, the fourth set is the one that is most interesting. Um, so as you can see this obviously the derivative of any term along zero is equal to zero but also we have this this um linearity that is not quite linearity but linearity only up to a second order term so that's that's a, a, an equivalence rule in our language uh, and finally we also have this sort of tailor's approximation that tells us that um, any application of, of a, a function to something of the form a plus epsilon b um, can be unfolded in terms of, of the derivative of that function. Um, and much like in the differential lambda calculus, we have this notion of um, differential substitution. And so one, one in the differential lambda calculus, the, the way you think about differential substitution is you take a term that may contain a variable x, uh, and the difference, differential substitution of x by s um, is you simply, you go through the term, um, you non-deterministically pick one of the occurrences of x in that term, and you replace that with the s. Uh, and so to, to do the non-determinism, you 
use um, sums of terms. So basically, you, you pick every possible position uh, of x in your term, you substitute it by s, and you add all of the resulting terms together. Um, differential substitution in this term, in, in this calculus, is slightly more involved. Mm. But still, it's more or less what you would expect when you keep the semantics in mind. The main, uh, the main difference is the rule for the differential substitution of a differential application, which so the fifth one from the top. If you are familiar with the differential lambda calculus, you will uh, you'll remember that in the differential lambda calculus, this is much simpler. This only has two. Uh, two terms, but because we're working with these sort of finite differences, we need to add a, a higher second order term. Um, and it turns out that this seemingly trivial difference makes a lot of proofs much harder because there's a combinatorial explosion in the size of the terms involved that you don't get in the differential lambda calculus. Uh, I'm going to uh, sort of skim through this because it's slightly too technical, but um, one question that I often get is how how did these differential substitution rules come to be? How did we uh, figure this out? Uh, and the best answer that I can give is, well, we we want a sort of semantic uh, syntactic Taylor's theorem to hold. We want uh, we want that um, t plus epsilon derivative of t with respect to x should be equal to t applies to um, x plus epsilon of s. Yes, that's intuitively what we want the differential substitution to mean. Uh, and so if you take this as a definition, what you can do is um, start with what you what you think this this the, the, the right hand side should be. So what, what should the derivative of, of t um, apply to x plus epsilon y be? You sort of um, reduce that through um, applying the sort of standard uh, algebraic equivalences in, in our language. And at the end, um, out of the other side comes what your differential substitution should be. I, I realize this is um, slightly vague, but this is not so much a theorem as it is a, a, a heuristic for figuring out what differential substitutions should be. Um, now, I, I think the uh, the important part of the the important thing about this calculus, the interesting thing about this calculus, is the it, it verifies, and this is this is a theorem. Uh, it verifies the syntactic form of Taylor's theorem. Um, so if you take a term s and you you substitute um, x by uh, t plus epsilon e, uh, it turns out that this is the same thing as taking s and substituting a, x by t. Uh, and then adding this um, partial derivative. And the importance of this will become manifest in, in, in a couple of slides. Um, but other than this, you should also be aware that this calculus, of course, verifies all of the, the reasonable properties. In particular, um, it is confluent um, given enough hand waving. So it is confluence up to uh, this algebraic equivalence relation that we introduced. Um, and it, 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 it's reasonably well behaved and lots of the theorems that you have in the differential lambda calculus uh, also hold for difference lambda calculus mod modulo some extra complexity and some uh, ancillary terms inserted throughout the proofs. Uh, but the the interesting consequence of this syntactic Taylor theorem is that it gives a, a poor man's account of forward mode uh, automatic differentiation. So how how should one, if we if we put on our machine learning hats for a second, um, we we might want to compute the derivative of of some program. Uh, how would we go about that using the differential lambda calculus? Well, we would have to uh, build this this um, differential application term and then evaluating it and, and reducing it. It turns out that this is potentially very, very expensive. Um, but thanks to the syntactic Taylor's theorem, um, we know that if we start with the, the original term that you want to differentiate, 
and you apply it to u plus epsilon v. So if you intuitively, if you evaluate it uh, at uh, a, a base point perturbed with some infinitesimal component, uh, if, you, if you can reduce it to a normal form, you know that that normal form will be equivalent to uh, the, the term evaluated at the non-infinitesimal part of the point plus some infinitesimal part, which is exactly equal to the derivative of the original term. Uh, so if your calculus um, has a way of, of subtracting terms and canceling, canceling out epsilons, uh, then you're essentially done. All you have to do is take the term that you want to differentiate, apply it at a plus epsilon b, now, what you get at the end, you subtract the original application, you cancel the epsilon, and you get the derivative. It really is that simple. Um, of course, the calculus that we present here does not feature subtraction, and it does not feature any way of cancelling out epsilons, because um, those features are actually um, kind of hard to, to integrate in, 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 a, in a lambda calculus. But it, on a practical level, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's more or less trivial. Uh, now, finally, one might ask, well, can we give a simple uh, type system for this? And the answer is, well, of course, I'm not going to spend much time here because this is more or less uninteresting. But in summary, you can take the, the difference lambda calculus. You can, uh, you can make it simply typed. And then you get what you would expect um, typing is well behaved with respect to this algebraic equivalence uh, and you get subject reduction um, progress and finally strong normalization more or less the proof is more or less identical to the corresponding one for the differential lambda calculus um, so finally uh, the point of this all was to, to to build the calculus that could have difference categories as a semantics now here I have to um, close on a, um, a bit of a cliffhanger. It turns out that there is a sound interpretation of the difference lambda calculus in difference um, lambda categories, which is to say Cartesian difference categories that are Cartesian closed and where um, currying is reasonably well behaved. Um, but um, we haven't proven yet, although we, we conjecture that this is the case, that the, the, the classifying category of the, the difference lambda calculus is a, a difference lambda category. And so uh, difference categories um, have the difference lambda calculus as an internal language. Uh, now I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my time. So I just want to point out a few areas where we, we want to work, where we, we are aware that these are interesting. Uh, but we haven't gotten quite so far um, yet. The first and most interesting one is um, how do we integrate iteration in the differential lambda in the difference lambda calculus? Is there is there such a thing as uh, a difference system T? And we have some very interesting leads on that one, but we haven't uh, done the legwork yet. We also want to. Uh, we also want to take this calculus and use it perhaps as a basis for an, an abstract machine, perhaps a, a, a difference version of the SSCD machine, and propose that as a way to uh, efficiently compile functional programming languages down to something that is amenable for automatic differentiation. Uh, and there are some, some theoretical leads that we think could be interesting, like finding uh, models from synthetic differential geometry, which is a branch of geometry that uh, integrates infinitesimal numbers within itself and where derivatives are uh, identical to derivatives in our sense, which is to say um, they are perfect approximations of the underlying function on infinitesimal elements. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think now we have some time for questions. Thank you, Mario. And indeed, we already have a question, a sort of, sort of a long one, uh, from Tom Hitchewitz. Maybe you you would like to ask it uh, by yourself. I mean, we don't really have time to a lot of long questions, uh, but maybe Tom, you want to to talk yourself. 
Thank you. Oh, Actually, that, I would. That, that is a long question. Yes. Yeah. No, it's six questions. So yeah, I'd rather so... <laughs> let Mario pick the most interesting ones if there are any. Yeah, or... Mario, can you see? I, it? I can. I can go over. I think I can go over most of them. Um, all of them. But, we're, yes, but we're, we're running. We're running out of time. So maybe, maybe yes. there is six questions. It might be an idea that you uh, respond in a in a way uh, that is uh, more offline. I, I, I'll, um, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, chart, that, that would so. be a good. Uh, that would be a good <laughs> idea. The, the, there, are, there are two that I think I can answer immediately and are interesting. Um, yeah, the first yeah. one is whether we have a, a non-trivial. Uh, incremental computing examples. Uh, my answer right now is uh, no, but we've used this theory or, or something related to this theory um, in our ESOP paper last year. It's called Fixing in Incremental Computation. Um, if you're interested in, in how this applies to incremental computation, I'd strongly suggest reading that because we, uh, we did some really cool work with uh, incrementalizing data log with derivatives. Uh, and the second one, the second question... You please read the question because only panelists yes. can see it, okay? Oh, of, of course. So the first question was, uh, have you coded non-trivial incremental computing examples in your calculus? Uh, and the answer is not directly in this calculus, but we've done um, closely related work, um, which you can read in our paper, Fixing Incremental Computation. Uh, and the second question, which I find interesting, is um, the tangent space of A being equal to A times A is um, slightly weird. So the, the intuition behind that is that the, 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 so you should think of T of A as the tangent bundle of A. Um, and you should think of A as something that is like um, a finite dimensional vector space in the sense that um, it is isomorphic to its own tangent space. So the, the, the tangent bundle um, functor in standard differential geometry is defined as the, the product of the base space times its tangent space. Uh, in this case, both the base space and tangent space are identical by, by definition. Uh, and so the tangent bundle Yes, that's right. But this, there, if you can send me an email about this, uh, I can tell you some incredibly interesting things that happen when you try to go to manifolds. So, so please get back to me on this because there's some really interesting stuff that's happening. 